Good afternoon. I'm Gila Sanders. I'm the Acting Executive Director here at the Bremen. And on behalf of our board and staff, I want to welcome all of you for being here, um, for being here at the Bremen and um, for bearing witness. Before we start, I'd like to start with a few words of thanks. The first one, of course, goes to our speaker, Henry Friedman. And <laughs> I know some of you might have uh, seen Henry already and know his story, but this is really a treat that, that we have in store for today. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have Henry here. Um, the second one goes to the Sarah Giles Moore Foundation. Um, we are so thankful for your partnership that really has enabled us to present this program to our public for free and, uh, and bring these important stories to, to the city of Atlanta. So thank you very much. Your presence here means the world to us. Today is um, Employee Appreciation Day, which I didn't realize, but I wanted, I wanted to give a shout out to the, uh, to the Bremen staff, and in particular to Michelle Langer, our Holocaust Survivor Coordinator, who's back there. And of course, to Rabbi Joe Prass, who's the Interim Director of the Weinberg Center for Holocaust Education. He'll be joining us here in just a second. And finally, on your chairs, you have two pieces of paper. One is a flyer with some upcoming programs and the next two um, parts of the Bearing Witness series. So please take note and put them on your calendar, if you will. And the other one is a survey. You'll be reminded about this at the end of the program, but please take a minute when, when the program is done to complete this. It will, it will just really take a second, and it's, it's a very important part of, of what we do here, and we'd love to hear from you. So without further ado, please help me welcome Rabbi Joe Prass. Good afternoon, my friends. Today we will hear the amazing story of Henry Friedman. Born in the city of Najvarad, also known by its modern name of Oradia, Henry's story takes place against the backdrop of the ever-changing borders that happened throughout Europe. As Hungary was an ally of Germany, it embraced the same anti-Semitic ideology as the Nazis. And initially, as an independent country, the Jews did not yet face mass deportation. Leading up to World War II, Hungary was pressured by domestic radical nationalists and fascists. Hungary fell increasingly under the influence of Germany as the Nazi regime consolidated itself in the 1930s. And when Germany began to redraw national borders in Europe, Hungary was able to regain territory, which included northern Transylvania from Romania, and it was in this region that Henry's hometown was located. The Hungarian racial laws passed between 38 and 41 were modeled on Germany's Nuremberg laws, and they reversed the equal citizenship status granted to Jews in Hungary. And among other provisions, the laws defined Jews in so-called racial terms. They forbade intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews and they excluded Jews from full participation in various professions. The laws also barred employment of Jews in the civil service and, re and restricted their opportunities in economic life. In 1939, the Hungarian government, having forbidden Jews to serve in the armed forces, instead established forced labor service for young men of, a of arms bearing age. And by 1940, the obligation to perform such forced labor was obligated upon all able-bodied male Jews like Henry. After Hungary entered the war, the forced laborers organized into labor battalions under the command of the Hungarian military were deplored on, deployed excuse me, on war-related construction work, often under brutal conditions subjected to extreme cold without adequate shelter or food or medical care, at least 20,000 Hungarian Jewish forced laborers died before the German occupation of Hungary. And then in 1940, November, Hungary joined with the Axis Alliance. According to a 41 census, Hungary had 825,000 Jews 
that was only about 6% of the total population. And then in March of 44, Germany occupied Hungary and immediately set in motion its plans to liquidate one of the last intact Jewish communities in occupied Europe. Within one month, Jews were ordered to report to urban areas and to concentrate in ghettos. And in the following three short months, almost a half million Jews were deported to concentration camps from Hungary. And even as the Nazis were placing in motion their plans to deport the Jews, we will hear how Henry received the notice to report to service in support of the Hungarian army as a forced laborer. Now he had to endure unimaginable cruelty and abuse. And then having survived the war, Henry began to make a new life for himself, first in Italy and then here in America. Following our film, Henry will join me at the center of the stage for some discussion, and then we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. And now, my friends, the amazing story of Henry Friedman. What I learned from Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady during the Second World War, we said, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. I took this quotation very, very strongly and connected with my life. Before the Holocaust started, we lived a fair, fairly normal life. I was working and studying and I had several hobbies like bookbinding, which was very unusual, photography, and I enjoyed reading. We lived for generation and generation in the same city, but the city changed from Austro-Hungary to Hungary, Romania, back to Hungary and back to Romania. When, the, when I was sick, that I was drafted into Hungarian army, my first thing what came my head that uh, that what will happen or if the Germans occupied my hometown, my father was already taken to forced labor. On the Hungarian army, my brother was already taken to forced labor. My brother-in-law was forced labor. I was not 100% that what are waiting for me and how the whole thing will work out with the top coat, backpack ready to go to a railroad station. And I kissed my family goodbye, not knowing that, knowing that I will never see them again. After I kissed them, my grandmother pulled me aside and she wanted to meet someone in a duplex. And as we entered with that next door, it was an old man with a long white beard. I never, I never met him before in my life with a prayer shawl draped over his shoulder. And as we entered, he put the prayer shawl over my head and he blessed me. When I received that blessing from that man, I didn't put too much importance because I was too much preoccupied. But later on, when I studied a little bit more, it was, it, it was a, a priestly bless, blessing. And that blessing was with me 
like a shield of protection. I'm not a religious individual, but I'm a very, very spiritual one. And I do believe that without that blessing, I would not be here today. When I arrived to that draft camp where I was drafted, I noticed that bulletin board, they're looking for volunteers with mechanical background. At first I didn't want, want to volunteer, but later on I volunteered. And with a group, maybe I was 50, we were sent to Budapest to a tremendous big factories. And that, that factory manufactured aeroplanes, tanks, and just about everything connected to the war industry. And I was in that factory maybe for about three months. And I remember that a Hungarian captain singled me out. He said, you, some of the points of you stars are loose. And to the sergeants in charge that I want to see the Jew in my office right now. So the three of us, we walked through his office, no conversation, like a smirk on his face, and he started to beat me. Later on, I find out that Hungarian captain was in charge of the whole factory, about 100,000 workers, but he singled, well, singled me out because the points of my star were loose, and that was the crime. So that Hungarian captain was beating me, and beating me, and he was find out where I was working, and he paid me a visit every day for about two weeks. He picked up a piece of steel pipe and beat him from the back. After the second week, I was in very, very bad shape. When I went back to the quarters, I told the man in charge, and I came up with a story. I show my back, it was a very, very bad shape. But then I opened my shirt and my whole front was nothing but a solid scab and pus running out of my system. And I told the man, look like, look like I have some kind of infection. Since you live in a very close quarters, please send me to a hospital, send me to a doctor to find out, find out if I'm contagious or not. And next morning, put on a train, and we were taking about 250 miles west from Budapest to a real big army hospital. From the first day, I was kind of shocked because I received the same clean bed like everybody else. I had the same food like everybody else. I was treated like a human being. I stayed in the hospital maybe for about three, three and a half months. Every day, physician came from bed to bed. And as I recall, the last time I was told not to wait by the hospital because the men in charge want to see me. So the next morning I went to see that man and he closed the door behind me. He says, son, I know who you are and I, I know why you are here. I want you to hear it from me and from no one else that in a couple of days we'll send you back to your unit. I just looked at him. He must be a saint because it was important for him, for me to hear it from him and from no one else they will send me back. They are experiencing heavy casualty from the Russian front. Hungarian soldiers coming back without limb, they need a space. When I came back, from the hospital, I was told that the that Hungarian captain who was beating me was looking for me for a long, long time, finally gave up, but they tell me that it's a, a miracle happened in Budapest. A miracle happened because an angel by the name of Raoul Wallenberg 
a Swedish diplomat showed up in Budapest in late 1944 to save Jewish lives. And I was told, if I'm successful, if I'm able to get to see him, he can help me. So I went to see him. He gave me a, a temporary passport, which said, whose name appears on this document under Swedish protection and waiting for a transport to go to Sweden. But the leader on the Hungarian, the German, did, did not respect it anymore. And, uh, and I was marching, marching towards Germany. Was sub-zero temperature and I had no proper clothing and uh, on the fifth day a courier catching up with us that we needed we had to take him back to Budapest that courier was a fake it was a Raoul Wallenberg's doing When the Russian came to Budapest and I was staying in a Tatars in the stable, the Russian cut off the running water, they cut off the electricity, and wasn't any food, was no heat. So they were taken to a temporary ghetto, which was formed in Budapest, a temporary ghetto, wasn't prepared, wasn't food, there was nothing. One day on, I'm on the street. And I tried to find, I tried to steal some food. And the German patrol stops me. And uh, was maybe about a couple dozen like myself were taken to a German outpost. When we arrived at that outpost, I was told that our job will start every day, three in the afternoon. We will climb the mountains, and on top of the mountains, we will distribute hot food to the German soldiers who are digged in in fax holes, facing the Russians also in fax holes. And after when we finish distributing the hot food, we will have to carry on the base of, of the mountain, on the stretchers, dead or wounded soldiers. I was doing that job maybe for about two or three weeks. I don't remember how long. But the last time I was getting on a stretcher down to the base, I was start to descend with a dead or wounded German soldier on a stretcher and a shrapnel explodes next to me and explodes and tears up my whole left thigh. I just sat down, like being on a boat, and I was paddling myself down on the icy slope. When I was on the base of the icy slope, I remember not far from there, it was a civilian hospital. Instead of rest, I went to the hospital, and I begged them, please help me with my leg. On the anesthesia, they took the fragments of the shrapnel off of my leg, and when I came, when the whole thing was over, I begged them, please keep me there. As long as I was useful to the Germans, they kept me alive, but if I'm useless, they will kill me. The answer was, if they find out they are half running at you, everybody will be shot. I had no choice. I wobbled back to the place where we were staying. Three o'clock, everybody jumps up. I tried to get up myself, but unable to stand up on my feet. The German guard comes to me, what's wrong with you? I said, Not, nothing wrong with me, I want to go to work. But the dirty, blood-soaked blood -soaked breaches and the opening where they tore my breaches apart, in the bright, bandage what they put on that morning and they told the whole story so the guard said look like you are wounded you stay behind today 
And later we will come back for you. We will take you to a German hospital. All that afternoon they went through my head. German hospital? There's no such a place. I never heard such a place. Whoever was taken before me, whoever was told to take him to a German hospital, no one ever returned, no one ever sent any kind of message. But around five in the evening, they came back with three guards, horse and buggy. They put me on the top of the buggy. And they also put two fellows who were also stayed behind. They put us on a wagon and take it to the cemetery. When I found out that we wind up in a cemetery and that was a German hospital, the two fellows who was also with me, they helped me up. And I was looking down the barrel of a rifle. And that's all what I remembered. It must be the next morning when I cannot catch my breath, I, I cannot breathe. And I feel around and I felt two fellows who helped me up, who helped me to be able to stand up. They was laying across my chest with their body and their blood kept me not face to death in a cemetery. And I just realized at that time that I just survived a firing squad. When I reached that hospital, I remember that I was told that I'm not welcome there, so I find an opening where they kept the charcoal and I covered myself with charcoal. I was hiding over there for a couple of days, but for thirst, fever, I had to put something in my mouth. And I was wobbling around, and must be a morgue because there were several marble tables there. And one of the tables I found of a plate of fried chicken, solid frozen with green mold. All my life, even today, I'm allergic to poultry. I can't eat no poultry. It makes me sick. But every day, I broke a small piece of the chicken, and with my charcoal, charcoal hand, I scraped the green mold from the chicken, and that what ate. Later on, the shelling, the noise got closer and closer to my hiding place. And one morning, I hear Slovak conversation under my hiding place. The Russians are there. After a couple hours later, when the thing kind of quieted down, I climbed out. I went to the main place in the basement and I stopped the first nurse and I asked them to please help me with my leg. And they took care of me. They gave me a cut and I made myself some crutches, two broomsticks, I put on some rags on top of the broomstick and was able to wobble around. I figured since the Russians are there, pretty soon I was able to go home. But, uh, I, but I found myself in marching again. The Russian lined me up with a couple hundreds of German prisoners of war in, with German, in German uniforms, in Hungarian prisoner of wars, and were marching to the only one existing bridge to go to the other side of the river. And as I'm walking, a young girl kind of motioned me, and I went towards her. I broke through the line, just disregarding the Russian guards with the machine guns. I walked to her and she told me, get lost. Get lost. His column is going to Siberia. Get lost. By the time I digest what she's telling me, she disappeared. I stopped the first pushcart. I said, do you mind if I help you to take the, 
to help it to push the push cart across the bridge. It's a fine. So when I'm on the other side of the bridge, I stop the first person, please give me direction how to go to the railroad station. I want to go home. Budapest is a tremendous big metropolitan city. It's getting dark already. I'm still asking for direction. The last person I ask must be a good Samaritan because he asked me, who are you? So I told him, where did you, where did you home? So I told, the, told him the name of my city. He said, that's not Hungary anymore, that's Romania. And since the Romanian army was close with the, with the Russians at the end of the war, if I put on a Romanian armament, which is red, yellow, and blue, I will be treated better by the Russians if they capture me. He had me an armband. He took me to the railroad station. I knew one thing. When the whole thing was over, and I realized it, that I'm the only one survived, I knew one thing, that I can't live in that place. I had to start a new life, to go any place and to forget about what happened. for me. I could crawl in a corner and feel sorry for myself, which would never help me. So when I left Europe, when I came to the United States, I want to start a new life, and that's what I did. So. Yesterday is gone. I cannot bring my family back. I cannot just deal with the situation with the what happened. I have to start a new life and to be the whole thing behind me. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. before we even get into some discussion, thank you for sharing your story with all of us. I feel like it's my duty, my obligation, even if it's unpleasant, that the whole thing not to be repeated again. If we, if we stay quiet about it, it may happen. 
Well, let's begin our discussion setting up the story. The movie picks up and talks about when you're drafted into the war. But your family had a long and rich history in your city, um, in the city that, where you were born. Tell us a little more about your family. Help, help us understand the context of your siblings, your father, your mother. Tell us a little more about before the war. Anti-Semitism, it existed all the time. And uh, I remember in my youth that I survived several times, different time programs, special around Eastern time. Because as I recall, when Eastern came, rumors went around, the Jews are killing innocent Christian girls and they put the Christian girl's blood to making muscles. So that's what I recall on an early age. So anti-Semitism was always around me. I live a fairly good, normal life. Like I said before, my father, he was an insurance broker. He made a pretty good living and everything was fine. And siblings? Did you have siblings? I was the youngest one. I had a brother and my sister was the oldest one. And uh, I can't even recall, not even the face of my brother. I don't even remember what he looked like. I haven't got any picture of, of him. Is everything fading away? The only thing what I remembered that he was the opposite of me. He was very outgoing. It was very easy for him to make friends. He was a very, very likable individual. He was forced in the army. He was on a forced labor battalion. And some of his girlfriend, gentle girlfriend, wrote to him and they have some care package for him. And he answered back. He doesn't need anything. He wants a care package to be sent to his little brother. Even though he had a hard time, he wanted me to have his care package. That's what I recall of him. It's hate for me to not have any picture. And in my mind, his memory fading away. The only thing what I recall very sharply about the care package, that even in that bad situation, he was worried about me. And tell us a little more about your religious upbringing, were you very religious? Were you, did you become bar mitzvah? How did the family, you, you were singled out as Jews, so how did you practice your Judaism? We were quite assimilated. I even learned Yiddish. It was in Italy. We were very, very assimilated. We observed the Jewish uh, traditions, the holidays. We had, I, as I recalled, we had four sets of dishes for dairy, for meat, and other set of dishes for Passover. My grandmother, she lived with us, and she wore uh, 
herpes because she had a shaven head because her husband requested to shave her head. She did what, but because of husband, she went along. And we kept kosher house. We have observed the holidays. Let's skip ahead a little bit. The, the movie says that when you were first drafted, you saw a board that said, volunteers with mechanical background wanted. You told me a story about how you had that mechanical background. T tell us a little bit about how you had that mechanical background. All my life, somehow, uh, I, I just want to, to see how textiles are made. And I was very much involved with, uh, with the textile industries. And I was working in factories where they manufactured the textile machineries. And that was my dream to be a textile engineer, but things changed. Also, you had the opportunity to meet the famous diplomat, Raul Wallenberg, um, or the movie says you did. Tell us about that interaction, that, that part of those, those fateful interactions that saved you one more time. I spent a lot of time in, in hospitals somehow. I was fortunate to spend time in hospital, even not needing it, but it was a good place for me to exist. And we had doctors coming every day, checking out, checking out the, the people. And one day, a man came. I don't remember his name, but he said, I know who you are. I know why you are here. But he gave me an, a note. He gave me an address of Raoul Wallenberg's address. I was able to get out from the hospital and went to visit Raoul Wallenberg and asked him for his help. He gave me immediately a suspense, like a temporary passport. And he said, whenever I'm stopped, show that passport that I'm a Swedish citizen, and that's how I met Raoul Wallenberg. He was very, very helpful to me. You also said there was an additional story, the article you shared with me from Yad Vashem, that you were also supposed to find shelter in one of the safe houses um, as part of this story, but what happened? Why weren't you able to find shelter in one of these safe houses and then Share with us what might have become if you had found shelter. Actually, I didn't know nothing about the safe houses. After what I found out that Raoul Wallenberg purchased those safe houses and was Hungarian police standing guard in the front of the safe house, the Swedish flag flew over the safe houses. I was wondered that how come I wasn't able to, to take advantage to leave one of the safe houses? Why do I have to go to hard times? But when the whole thing was over, Budapest came under the siege. The Russian color of the electricity, the Russian color of the running water. In Budapest, 
was it any food? So the, some of the Hungarian police and different Hungarian anti semites they broke into those safe houses. They stole all the food, whatever Raoul Wallenberg left for the Jews. And they took the Jews out. They tied the shoelaces together, one together with the other one, and took them to the frozen Danube River and threw in a couple of Jews with shoot lives tied together, and one pulled in the other one. So if I would have been in those safe houses, I would have been thrown in the frozen Danube River, and I would die in the frozen river. But Almighty helped me again, and I was able, he was not able to be in the safe house. Let's fast forward a little bit to some little bit happier times for a moment. Soon the war is over and you end up moving towards Italy. We don't see much of that in the film. Tell us a little bit about how you got to Italy and a little bit about what you did when you were in Italy. Whenever I find out what was going on, I made up my mind that I have to leave Europe. I have to start a new life someplace. I choose Italy because Italy with the big ports, ocean liner was coming and going, and like a naive, naive Italian, Naive young man, I want to go in a big port city, jump in a big ocean liner, and hide in a cargo. Let the boat take me wherever it takes me. I was even was thinking about if I would survive or not, but that was my aim to go where big ocean liners are coming and going. Well, but you were there for five years. So what did you do for five years? How did you uh, spend the time? What did you find to do? I, I have actually a picture that I know you know very well right behind us um, from a Shalom Alechem play. Um, tell us a little more about what you did while you were there in Italy for a while. All my life, even today, I just have to reinvent myself to come up with all different ideas to be alive. For me, life was not easy. And I spent five wonderful years in Italy. Wonderful people. I enjoyed every minute of it. Italy was very, very good to me. And Italy, like I was painting, I was doing all different things just to invent myself, to have something. Like I said, I had a bad habit. I was born with a bad habit. I like to eat every day. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, behind us, can you let me help? Ah, oh, there you go. Tell us about this picture. We have three pictures of your time in Italy. What's going on in this picture, my friend? I'm sitting in the front with a paint bucket. And here, I, I invented myself that I was a stage painter. So this was a theatrical group playing a uh, book, a play from Sholem Aleichem, and I was painting the, the background of the stage. We have another picture. Let's, we have three from your time there. A handsome young man. It's a little in the background. Uh, it's still the same handsome fellow. Still the same handsome fellow. <laughs> right. I stand corrected. I apologize. <laughs> it's forgiven. But anyway, 
whatever you see here, you see just blank canvas. And whatever you see pa pictures, that's all my stage painting. That's what I was creating as a stage painter. And the third picture, if we might. That's also for different occasions of the painting, the portraits. That's my doing. Gorgeous, gorgeous. We're going to come back in a minute to the uh, to the painting. I know it was a little misunderstood when you. Uh, well, why don't we jump ahead for just a moment? We'll, we'll, we'll have a few more details while you're in Europe. But this beautiful painting skill, when you came first to Atlanta, how did they understand or misunderstand this ability uh, for you to do this type of painting? What was the first job in Atlanta you got? Anyway, <laughs> the first, of Vena, first day when I arrived to Atlanta, a social worker interviewed me. Henry says, you spent five years in Italy. What have you done in Italy? So I told them, I was painting. She never asked me any detail. <laughs> so the next day, she found me a, a job. I became a house painter. <laughs> <laughs> As a house painter, it was still, I owned a, an honest, Paycheck, I earned it because I'm working very hard for it. But what was all that, the painting, what I was used to do? I will never forget that I was painting an African American church, and me being at the Greenhorn, it was too tall, stepladder. It was an extension board between two letters. And being a greenhorn, they put me in the center of the extension board and I was shaking like a leaf. <laughs> I, I was used to paint very, very high. And the only security what I had, the handle of the paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> so I was to do house painter for about a year. One more question before we open it up to the floor. You've arrived in Atlanta. You uh, first start um, mistakenly as a house painter. Just tell us a little more about what happened once you came to Atlanta. What did you do? How did your family continue to grow here in Atlanta? Tell us anything else you'd like to before we open up the floor. When I came to Atlanta, very shortly after, I, some, someone asked me, do I want to work in a private club? I said, fine. So I learned the food industry. I don't believe anybody remember it. Atlanta used to have a very, very fine private social club called the Atlanta Jewish Progressive Club. <laughs> Sounds like a few do remember it. <laughs> and, uh, and they took me in to the club. That time, life was different than, than what we're experiencing today. A Jew wasn't able to go any place to eat. It was special houses, restaurants, where the Jew was all welcomed. Thank God, things kind of changed. And uh, I was taken into that special private club, and everybody claimed that I belonged to the club. In 1956, I got married, and a club claimed that I belong to the club. <laughs> so even though my wife wanted to have a wedding in Macon or Savannah, the club said that they would give me a, a club for 
I had about 150 people invited to, the, to my wedding. All the food, all the drink covered the club who owned me. So anyway, I have wonderful memories. In 1956, I got married. And thank Almighty, they gave me 61, 61 wonderful years. In this life, nothing lasts forever, but I had a wonderful wife, wife for 61 years. I still mourning not to having her. If she would be alive today, she would be in that corner to try to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're gonna open up the floor to some questions now, Henry. Very good. If, if Oh, yes? Yeah, yes. yes All right. Please, if you have a question, please, um, our time is limited, so please confine remarks to questions and not remarks. We're going to start in the center right there. I'm going to come closer so I can repeat if you need. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering. I, I, please stand up. I, I have too much vaccine. I was just wondering, it wasn't mentioned at all, what made you decide to leave Italy and come to America and what brought you to America? Asked that it was on my list, but yes. What made you decide to leave Italy and come to America? I forgot to ask that one question. <laughs> you know, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, let me think about it. But but anyway, I knew that that Italy was only a temporary spot for me and I heard about Atlanta many many times like gone with the wind <laughs> and uh, at this moment I don't remember why I choose Atlanta I don't remember Okay. Let, let me come back to it. We, if, all right. All right. Do we have other questions? Please raise your hand. I think I saw a young man over in that. Nope. He changed his mind. That's all right. Other questions, please. I see one right there. And then there's one in the back, Lori. Good. Back row after this. I first of all just want to thank you so much for telling your story and how much it means to me and my friends that are getting to hear you. Um, how old were you when you were drafted into the service? And then how old were you when you went to Italy? What were, what were your ages? And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. L let me correct you. Okay. I, I know. You, you want to know how young I am? <laughs> yes. The easy thing, the easy thing to tell you that I'm only 94. Congratulations. I don't want to go, I don't want to push my luck. I don't want to go to 120. <laughs> I don't How old you. were you when you were drafted? 21. 21? 21, when I was drafted, and uh, 26 when I came to the United States. How did you get to be that old if they were taking men, boys, that were of um, military age? I mean, 21 sounds old. Well, you were drafted at 21. Why weren't you drafted earlier or younger at, at 18, 19? Do you know why the draft didn't come to you before 21? Probably I wasn't ripe enough. <laughs> I don't know. I doubt that. It, it, it's when the draft arrived. <laughs> I think in the, in the back row, if you'll stand up, please. Yes. Um, so in the film, you said that your grandmother was the one who um, gave you this blessing that saved your life. And I was wondering if you have any memories of your grandmother that you would be willing to share with us. Wow. Your grandma was the one who took you to see the rabbi for the blessing, but could you share other memories of your grandmother? Do you have other memories? 
whenever I have a chance to talk about my family, I always talk about my grandmother. She was an angel. She was a wonderful person. She had no an easy life. And I wondered how come my mother's maiden name was Zuckerman and my grandmother's name was Kraus. And later on, when I got much, much older, I found out that my grandmother lost her husband when my, when my mother's father passed away in the early age. And she remem remembered, uh, she remarried a gentleman, and she had three daughters that the, the new husband, she lost, uh, he lost his wife, and my grandmother was, a, I had no husband, and later on, when I was much, much older, I found out the reason that they had different names. My grandmother, she must have been a wonderful person because she raised those other daughters beside my mother, just like her own. She must have been a wonderful person. And I just have wonderful memories of my grandmother. She has done so many things. She was an angel. Yeah. Over. Ah. You, you know this young lady. Hi, Henry. Thank you so much for speaking today. Do I know you? I think I, think I know you, <laughs> okay. yes. You're a treasure to the Bremen and to all of us, and it's a privilege to know you. Um, there's a story that you've told me before that I would love for you to tell about one of your first impressions in America and you were looking for a drink and it wasn't what you expected. Do you looking remember for? this story? When you were looking, when, when you first came to America, you were looking for a drink and you had a, a surprise. You've told this story before. Oh. <laughs> like, you see, I just want to talk about pleasantries. You just, oh, you, you, you just mentioned something, what, it kind of hurt me. <laughs> it, it hurt me. It, it, it was a hot day. I think it was Washington, D.C. I arrived to the United States, and it was a hot day. It was a vending machine. And I see root beer. I liked beer. <laughs> I, was, I was looking forward for a wonderful can of cold beer. <laughs> root, I thought it was a brand name. <laughs> Awful thing. <laughs> Do we have over here? I see a question. Henry, this is your friend Kelly. I've known you over 50 years. You never told me how you chose to come to Atlanta. Atlanta? Do, 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 why you do, a, a question not only how you came to America, but do you remember Atlanta specifically? I remember that this is the second, you are the second person asked me the same question. <laughs> And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I was asking for some time, give me some time to come up with a reason. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to come to you second, sir. We're going to go over here first. I have one, one question waiting over here. Yes. Um, thank you for coming and speaking to everybody today, Mr. Friedman. I question, have you been back to Hungary since coming to the United States, since you uh, relocated over here? Have you been back to Hungary since you have come to America? 
No. No. The, the reason is so many wonderful things to see in this world. Hungry brings back only bad memories. I don't have any de desire to ever go back. Over here, we have a question. If I understood, you're on. If I understood you correctly, you had uh, your mother had three stepsisters. Um, have you been able to locate any of your family that has survived the war, other than yourself? No. Uh, We had three kind of quite a done and I find out that from a very, very big family, I am the only one survived. I don't have nobody. Over here, Henry, on this side. Yeah. Hi. I teach a, a high school class um, on World War II, and I focus a good bit on the Holocaust. My question to you would be, if there was one thing that you would want me to make sure my students understood about your story and about the story of your people and, and Hungary and what happened during this time, what would that be? Uh, he's a teacher. He's a high school, high, school, high school teacher who's teaching about World War II. If there's one thing that you want to make sure that young people understand today about the Holocaust and what happened in Hungary, what is your message? The message is I learned a lot from my wife. She was very, a very wonderful person and she was telling everybody there is only one race, the human race. And that's what I believe in, only human race. No one individual better than the other one. We have to try to improve ourselves, to be more decent to each of us to try to do the good thing and to come up what good thing can I do with my time today? How can I improve this world? So that's what I would like to believe. And like I said, I would like to believe that I'm a decent man, a decent human being and I would like to see how can I help my next, my next person in the city. I, I didn't want to say how to, can I improve my neighbor because one of my neighbors is here today. <laughs> he, he seems like a decent enough gentleman. We have, we have another. <laughs> I have two quick questions. One is, what did you do at the Progressive Club? Uh, and Okay, what did you do at the Progressive Club? Then I'll ask my other question. What did you do at the Progressive Club? The, I think the, the first month when I went to the Progressive Club, it was a board meeting and the president of the club was there, and it was a fellow hiding in a corner. His name was Harvey Lupo. He was, uh, he was selling produce to the Progressive Club. And the club called me in that Mr. Lupo complaining since the club been buying from Lupo for for a long, long time, he said that I may have getting a kickback on the t table money from different purveyors. 
So the presence of the club was there in, in many individuals. I said that I'm new in this country. The only thing what's very, very important to me is my name and my signature. Since I don't want to pay kickback to nobody, I don't want to receive kickback on the table from nobody, and since he was the, he tried to sell me produce for much higher price than what I was able to buy from different places, that's why he's not supplying anything to the Progressive Club. So I, with that visit, I gave confidence, and I was told that keep going, keep doing the way I want to, to take care of the Progressive Club. I was a buyer at the club, and the club was so pleased with me, like I mentioned, they gave me a very big wedding, and they appreciate my doing question. Did I see Barbara Walters in one of the pictures there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, 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 why, why did she... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should explain that. Why, in one of, in one of the, the pictures in the film. For some reason, my wife was mentioned, are you Barbara Walters? With so many questions, my wife got tired she said, yes, I'm Barbara Walters. It's, it, was, it, was, it was his wife, Sherry, to, to be clear. I think we had a question in, 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 the, in the center aisle there. Did you ever have to use the passport? Were you ever asked for it and, have, and did it ever save you or get you through another situation having to show the fake Swedish passport? The, pass, the passport that you received from Wal Wallenberg, did you ever have to use it? Did you ever have the opportunity to use it? I don't think so. No, I, I, I never used it. I never used it, but he was very, very gracious to me. <laughs> and, and, and like he invited, I think, a normal for me to go to Sweden. And I never done nothing with it. Right here. Mr. Henry. You could always say that you moved to Atlanta because the girls are smart and pretty here. <laughs> you could always say you moved to Atlanta because the girls are smart and pretty. <laughs> you 100% correct. <laughs> and, and, and that, where I find mine, my Barbara Walters. <laughs> I think we're done with our questions. I'm Craig Frankel. I'm the chair of the Bremen. And let me just thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I, I think as we hear the humor and, and, the, and the real kind of um, uh, soul of, of Henry, this is a treat. This is a treat that we're not going to have for a lot longer for a lot of our survivors. So thank you, Henry, for being here. Excuse me. Let me just correct a little bit. <laughs> There's a full house because the price is right <laughs> and, and raining outside. And, and, and that's a good point. Have a full house when it's raining out is actually. Do thank you. Thank you for the Sarah Giles Moore Foundation uh, for making this possible.